In one of our earliest videos on YouTube, I took the contents of this Beatles stereo box set and threw them in the bin. But why did I do that? And what's in this box? I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and welcome to the ultimate Beatles stereo vinyl box set. Okay, throwing them in the trash was a bit melodramatic, but I was trying to make a point, and it's all to do with digital versus analog. This mono box set was cut from the original analog tapes, and the stereo set was cut from digital files. Not only is the mono box set long out of print on vinyl, it's not available on streaming either, and there's no prospect, as far as I'm aware, to release a stereo box set cut from an analog source. So in order to get a full analog stereo set, you need to go back to this. The Beatles Collection box set, or as it's known by some collectors as BC13, was first released in 1978 and stayed on catalogue until 1986. It was produced in many different countries around the world and contained numerous cover variations. But the one thing they all had in common is that they were all cut from an analog stereo source. It wasn't until 1987 and the release of the CDs that the Beatles vinyl albums were cut from the digital masters. Now, some of you may be asking what all the fuss is about. Well, for many people, there is a significant difference in the sound quality between vinyl cut from a digital master and one cut from an analog tape source. So if you really do want the best original sounding stereo albums, the best thing you can do is hunt down one of these BC13 sets. And whilst not every set from every country sounds the same, they have one more thing in common. They're all great value for money. Now in that original video, I went about remaking or refilling the stereo box set with what I thought were the best possible stereo sources for each particular album. And although I still stand by the contents of that set, I'm now taking it to a different level. They've created in this box what I think is not only the best sounding, but the best looking set of stereo analog Beatles LPs there is. Now the actual box I've used to house them in is not from the 2012 set, but one which was used to house part of the 2017 Di Agostini set of mail order albums. And if you're not sure what that is, there's a video about it on the channel, a link to which is in the description. But this box doesn't contain a single Di Agostini pressing, something much more special in fact. Inside here are, in my opinion, the premium stereo vinyl pressings of not only the core Beatles album catalogue, but some essential extras too. Now before we start going through it, I'll say that if you want to own this set, stay tuned until the end of the video, when I'll be telling you how you can get your hands on this unique set. But right now, let's get it over to the unboxing table and take a look at exactly what's inside. In the box are 18 UK albums, pressed between late 1969 and early 1971. Now, I wouldn't usually wear gloves for unboxings because after I'd unboxed a record, I'd clean it. But as these have already been cleaned, I'm going to use them. So as you can probably see, the first record in the set is The Early Years. Pressed on Contour, Polydor's budget label, these are all the Hamburg recordings. And despite what it says on the sleeve, electronically reprocessed to give a stereo effect, these are all true stereo recordings. This is the earliest pressing of this album on the Contour label with the red rim text and red lines on the label, which later changed to black. A really good high quality pressing and really excellent high quality recordings. It was reissued in the 70s in this very 70s cover with all the same tracks, which are again, all in true stereo but I've gone for the early Beatles in my box set just because I like the cover better. The copy of Please Please Me I put in my initial box was this German pressing from the early 70s, which has a fantastic stereo sound. But for this set, I've gone with the UK configuration of Please Please Me. This pressing has the small front stereo indicator and has a beautiful front laminated panel and 
flip bags on the rear cover. This particular copy was bought in Great Yarmouth, a seaside town in the east of England. Let's have a look at the record inside. Most pressings in this box have this particular inner sleeve. It was EMI's last advertising inner sleeve and features some Beatles albums. You've got Sgt. Pepper, Abbey Road, and Let It Be with its original uh, catalogue number PXS1, which wasn't actually printed on the box. It was just used for ordering purposes. And it also has uh, Sentimental Journey and McCartney on there too. A clue to its date comes from this album, which is Cilla Black's Sweet Inspiration, a copy of which I happen to have just here. There she is. Uh, it's kind of a, a weird sort of covers album. It has an interesting cover version of Across the Universe on there, if you want to check that out. Anyway, uh, this album was released in, as the date code here says, uh, July 1970. So this inner sleeve dates from July 1970. So these pressings are going to date from late summer, early autumn of that year, or at least retailed from that period. Please Please Me comes with one EMI box on the label. This label design was first introduced in October 1969. And this particular pressing, as all on this label do carry the original Dash 1, Dash 1 first pressing matrices. I keep them all in these uh, Flux Hi-Fi inner sleeves, um, which are very similar to the Mobile Fidelity type inner sleeves. Here's the packet they came in. And if you are in Europe, you can order these from our friends at protected.de. And very good they are too. There is a link in the description. Next up, of course, is with the Beatles. Again, a similar pressing to that of Please Please Me. Small stereo front indicator. Pristine front laminated cover and a beautifully white, clean, flip back rear panel. And it comes with exactly the same inner sleeve. We'll call it the Let It Be inner sleeve for now because it has Let It Be on it. And also the same label as the Please Please Me, the one EMI box label. Both sides, no spindleware at all on either side, and first pressing matrix on side one, first pressing matrix on side two, which was the dash two. While we're on with the Beatles, I wanted to show you this album, which is its mono equivalent from around that time. Now this album is extremely collectible because it has a small mono front indicator, which was very short lived. But this album was retailed at around the same time as the stereo copy we've just looked at in the same flip back cover. And it even has the same inner sleeve. Now this record's not going in this set because it's mono, um, but it will be available on the website, parlogramauctions.com, should you want to go and have a look or buy it. So EMI didn't press up special one EMI box labels for this. They just, well, I think they just used existing stock they had left over. But you can see this uh, ridge around the edge, which is a feature of all these 1970, 71 pressings. So it does mean this was pressed at that time and wasn't just old stock. Um, and it does have a very high stamper number, 317 on this side. I don't know if you can see that. It's a very high stamper number. On this side, it's uh, I think 710 and has the final mono cutting dash seven on both sides. There we go. Again, this is another pristine disc. 
um, and very, very rare. So I'll pop that on the website and you can have a look at your leisure. But next up in this box is, of course, A Hard Day's Night. Now, this album lost its front indicator at around the time it lost its uh, yellow and black label. Again, this one's a flip back cover, dating from the same time as the other two. Again, the Let It Be inner sleeve. This time, we've got a two EMI box label. So probably early 1970 for this one, or late 1970. And again, like the other two albums, it has the first pressing matrix, dash one on that side, and dash one on that side. Great sounding stereo album. Nice, clean, detailed sound from that. But, the greatest sounding stereo pressing, I think, of the Beatles' early stereo albums is this one, Beatles for Sale. This one always kept its front stereo indicator, but has an all-round laminate, which uh, kind of disappeared as the 70s went on, as its pinched spine, and of course, gatefold cover. Now, normally I wouldn't keep these records inside their covers after I clean them, but I'm just doing that for uh, purposes of this video. Same inner sleeve and the one EMI box label. But the important thing is this is a, a dash one, dash one, the first and best sounding cutting of this album. So warm and clear and detailed. Hasn't been bettered since. Help doesn't sound as good either in mono or stereo, but uh, stereo is definitely the preferred way of listening to this album. Again, a lovely clean and white flip back cover with no thumbnails or even spine wrinkles on there. Really lovely. Again, same inner sleeve. And like The Hard Day's Night, this has a two EMI box label. About 1970. And you can see the rim dates it to around this time. The Gramophone Limited, Gramophone Company Limited, indicates pressings before at least 1975. So what have we got on here? Dash one on this side. Yep, dash one on that side and dash one on that side. Rubber sole. This uh, pressing or this uh, cover has a much more orange hue to it than the original, which was much paler in color. So I'm not sure what went on there, but it's still a Garrett and Lofthouse cover with the flip backs. Perfectly clean, no scratching, no thumbnails, etc. etc. Again, the uh, Let It Be inner sleeve. On the back of these Let It Be inner sleeves, actually, is uh, are just some easy listening albums of uh, world music, and uh, there's Ken Dodd, Holiday, Holiday in Mallorca. Marlena Dietrich, Victor Sylvester, old time music basically, for the grown ups. <laughs> this pressing of rubber sole has two EMI boxes, but it does have the original 1965 dash three matrix on that side and that side. Early first pressings did have dash two, but um, in a matter of weeks, they recut it to dash three. So that is just as good as a first pressing matrix in my book. Revolver had a slightly different cutting history. Uh, again, no front mono or stereo indicator, but the flip backs are here. Bit of a bend on that corner. 
but otherwise very clean. Same inner sleeve. This time it's a, a two EMI box pressing, so 1970, late 1970. Perfectly clean. But this has, uh, let's see, where is it? There we go. This is dash two on both sides. This was one of the first or the first Beatles album to be recut. It was recut from its original dash one in uh, July 1970 to this dash two. Um, you can find one EMI box labels with the dash one on it, but um, most of them on that label are dash two. Next up we have from December 1966, a collection of Beatles oldies. Now this wasn't issued in the States, but it was issued in many other countries around the world and is a kind of greatest hits, a summing up of their uh, touring years, all the hits from 1963 to 1966, up to and including Paperback Writer in a lovely flip back cover. And say what you want about the artwork, it's in pretty good condition on this copy. Again, same inner sleeve. And these are pretty decent heavy pressings. I think about 160, 170 grams, these. Um, these are also known as pre-oil crisis pressings. Um, I mean, after that point, about 1973, EMI um, refitted its factory and contracted its sister company, Pathé Marconi in France, to press records for them. And once they reopened their factory, um, the oil crisis was on and the quality of the vinyl went down. They started using uh, fillers in the compound and it became noisier and not such good quality. Next up, of course, is Sgt. Pepper. This is a gorgeous uh, laminated cover. Love the way this laminate bends and bulges and folds over there. Gives it a really superb look. And the laminate here is pristine, both on the front and on the back. Inside too, a small creek. Don't open it too wide. Uh, no flipbacks on this edition. This was the first cover not to have flipbacks. A very square, but not wide spine. But a really perfect laminate on there. An interesting feature of this back panel, or this particular uh, variation, is that uh, it's marked as stereo here on the upper right corner. But at the bottom, we've got written here, this is a mono recording. This was a variant which only existed for a few months and it was obviously an error. So it was quickly corrected and is a very collectible record in its own right. Or the variant is anyway. There's the cutout sheet, slightly lighter in color than the original first pressings. Original inner sleeve. And I will say, I haven't swapped any of these inner sleeves out. They're all as they came to me. And I think they are all genuine. Two EMI box labels on this pressing. And dash one on that side. And dash one on that side. Most often you see this as a dash one, dash two combination as side two was recut in uh, September 1971, and side one, not until 1975. So there we go. Of course, we have to have Magical Mystery Tour in this box set, but not uh, the Capital Pressing or indeed the Parlophone Pressing. This is the Apple Pressing from Germany from uh, 1971. This actual copy dates from 1987, and it is, an analog DMM pressing. So cut from an analog tape, um, but using the DMM process, which I think brings out all the highlights of this legendary pressing, um, which is rich, deep bass and crisp highs. Amazing pressing. If ever you see that cover, just pick it up.
Next up out of the box, of course, we've got the White Album. Falling out already. <laughs> this is a, a kind of crossover pressing, if you like. Um, this one has a six digit number as opposed to the original seven. This is 137095 and still has the embossing on the front cover. But unlike the first pressings, it's not top opening, it's side opening. And also lacks its stereo indicator on the back. But let's get it unpacked and show you what we've got inside. These are uh, 1971, 1970 inner sleeves. Um, this says copyright exists in all Apple recordings. So these inner sleeves were added to most Apple pressings around that time. I've seen copies of RAM with these inner sleeves. You can see the mark where the, the photos were stored inside for a very long period of time. Uh, inside we've got obviously the poster, standard UK pressing poster. And in the other pocket we've got four portrait photos. Slightly thinner, lighter paper than the first pressings and paler too actually. Not as much colour on those as the first pressings. And a wider border, top and bottom. Slightly different to the first pressing. Everything is slightly different to the first pressing in this record. Labels are similar but different. Nice dark green apple label but missing sold in UK and has a slightly more condensed a different font typeface used on the labels. This disc has a dash one on both sides. Okay. Disc two has similar colored labels. But dash two on that side and dash two on that side too. Both analog cuttings, of course. Uh, this disc has the only sort of visible damage in the entire set. It has a small um, pressing or pressing blemish here. You can see that. But I've just played it through and it doesn't sound. Not uh, the tiniest of noise comes from that. So that's good news. Just a little visual flaw there, but uh, a terrific sounding cutting and pressing. This is Yellow Submarine. This one still has the um, flip backs and the red lines, which were switched to grey in about 1973. This also has the printer's credit, which early copies didn't have. So again, it's a sort of crossover pressing, but a beautiful laminate on that. Vibrant colours. Plain inner sleeves now. This is nothing more than a patent number and made in England. And again, the same label as the first pressing, but without sold in UK on the top. This one is a, a, a dash three. First pressings were, of course, dash one. But interestingly, looking at the cutting notes for this album, this was recut um, very quickly in March. 1969 actually, two months after it was released. So um, maybe dash one, dash one pressings are rarer than we thought. Uh, side two has dash one and side two wasn't recut until 1977. So uh, that basically stayed the same for quite a long time. But personally, I can't tell the difference between dash one and dash three. Uh, they both sound the same to me. So no, increase or decrease in sound quality. But Abbey Road, probably the best sounding Beatles album of all. This one is a 1971 pressing. Cover is slightly muted, is a bit faded. The colors are not as vibrant as the first pressing. Uh, they might come across that way on camera, but in reality, it's a bit washed out. Uh, the interesting thing about this cover is um, that it has 
unlike first pressings, a, a pinched spine. See at the end here, it's, it's pinched. Let me just get that in focus. There, it's pinched at the ends and it's pinched at that end. The originals were very round and um, you could barely read the writing at all. You can barely read the writing on that one unless I get it in focus. There we go. Inside we have, again, the Apple copyright inner sleeve and a beautiful dark green Apple label with on side two, Her Majesty listed on that label. Dash one on side two, dash two on side one is the first pressing matrices. And I found it's more difficult to find pressings with Her Majesty on these early labels than without actually. But um, this copy looks absolutely pristine. Really gorgeous sounding record. Next up, Let It Be. Uh, this didn't become available in the UK, at least, as a single album until November 1970. And this one has the, like, a bluish green Apple logo on the back. And like Abbey Road, too, this also has um, a pinched spine, if I can get it in focus. There we go. Pinched spine. The bottom. Again, early pressings didn't have that, they were just round. Yeah. Again, nice laminate, no thumbnails, scratching, etc. etc. You've got an Apple copyright inner sleeve here, too. And like Abbey Road, it still retains its dark green Apple label. In about 1972, they went uh, to a much lighter label, lighter coloured label. This one has uh, dash 3U pressing uh, cuttings on it, on both sides, dash 3U, dash 3U. Original box sets had dash 2U, uh, but still dash 3U is very, very similar to a dash 2U and is a great sounding cut. Now something the original BC-13 and 2012 box set didn't have, but kind of should have had, is Hey Jude. And originally it wasn't released in the UK until the late 1970s, but EMI did press some for export, mainly to Scandinavia in 1971 and through uh, the early 70s. This one is on the dark green Apple label with the errors, uh, revolutions and paper back writer and that label too, had a Y-E-E-X matrix. This copy is not as pristine as the other ones, but it's still a good VG Plus excellent and being cut from the original masters, the original UK masters, sounds amazing. And what box set would not be complete without 1962 to 1966 and 1967 to 70? These two are the 2014 um, reissues cut from the original analog master tapes. These two copies are still sealed and they both have the universal logos on the back, which means they were pressed in the EU and not in Canada as ones without that logo are. But a great sounding set cut from Harry Moss's original 1973 cutting notes and a great way to end this beautiful box set. So there you have it, a box full of amazing sounding analog stereo vinyl albums. And what about those beautiful laminated flip back covers? So what we're gonna do is to put this set up for auction on our website, parlogramauctions.com. The auction will begin from the moment this video goes live and will run for 10 days, ending on Wednesday, May the 10th at 9 p.m. Central European time. To participate in the auction, all you need to do is visit the website, parlogramauctions.com, create an account and put in a bid. But I'd advise not leaving it till the last second, which won't work anyway, 
because unlike eBay, our site automatically extends for a few seconds if a bid is placed at the last minute. The links to the website and more importantly, the auction listing are of course in the description. If you'd like to ask us a question about the item, you can do that directly via email to andrew at parlogramauctions.com. Also, if you have any rare vinyl or collectibles you'd like to sell yourself on the site, which is seen by all the top Beatles collectors worldwide, do get in touch with us about opening a seller's account so you can list them on the website yourself, just like you would on eBay. Alternatively, just take a look at what we've got on offer, or you can browse our 200 plus videos on YouTube. Also, let us know what your favorite pressing of a Beatles album is, and if you prefer them in mono or stereo. I'll be back next week with something completely different, but in the meantime, I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching. <laughs>